Hear ye, hear ye! The Parliament of Geek shall now come to order! And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Parliament of Geeks, where we ask one question. Be ye weeb or be ye scrub? I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have two brothers within the council here, here today. We have just returned, just returning from his from his excur from his excursion into the into the East Blue. Good brother Matty. And we have the the man who might have some competition when it comes to bane when it comes to being the bane of my existence. Good brother Xanatrix. And I'm only saying that because of the mullet elves that that Tanner put forward. There, there, there's no, there's no competition there. No, Tanner can't replace me. He can try, but then I'll just bane him too. Probably. <laughs> and yes, that was, and yes, the idea of elves with mullets is something I is an imagery I had to put up with this weekend. Oh, no, see, see, monk, there's an advantage to elves with mullets. It's a fuse. Set it on fire. There's that. Probably a lot of oil in that in that hair to get it so shiny. I mean, look look at Roman Reigns' hair. That's probably ninety percent baby oil when you think about it. <laughs> By the way, for those wondering, the short short answer: Oasis of the Seas, weeb, for sure. Mm. Drawn a Pearson Airport, scrub. <laughs> airports being dicker. We airports um, being a house of dickery. Um, is it Monday? Wait, it's Monday already. So I can't, so I can't use that joke. And it's not even nine thirty yet. Yeah, and I'll I'll explain why on the WrestleCast because for sure there will be time. We the rampage is on before the show, so we'll be we'll be taking care of that business soon enough. But before we get before we get into it, it is it is time to renew a. A couple, a couple traditions. One, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen of of our esteemed parliament, it is time to rise for our drinking anthem. Jesus, can my silver survive one more score? <laughs> score. Sound the yellow horn! There we go. By the way, I did not have an alcohol alcohol package, so I did not drink as much, but the joke still works. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, hey, so hey, if you get me one of them on, on one of them booze cruises, I'm still gonna have a Shirley Ginger, which is uh, Shirley Temple. Swatch, uh, uh, swap the Sprite for a ginger ale. In mm -hmm. fact, I'll do one better. If you can find a bar that has ginger beer, do that instead of the Sprite. You'll fake me later. I can go. I can go with that. Oh, which no bar, no bar that I know serves ginger beer, but I can. But there's plenty of stores where I can find that stuff. So hey, you could do, you do that do that in a couple of tablespoons uh, spoons of grenadine, depending on how big the uh, big the bottle of uh, ginger beer is. Believe me, it's a Shirley Temple, but spicy as hell. It cuts on half the sugar too. If worse comes to worse, I can just blame Brett Coleman. Fair for a point. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you've seen some of the drinks that he makes. <laughs> mm -hmm. By the way, some of you think, are you joking, Maddie? You're drinking Shirley Temples? Okay, first off, have you seen the prices on that Kahlua and Coke on that first person, Maddie? That's U.S. dollars. That's 20 bucks. So I was not drinking freely. Though the refreshment package, if you're not drinking, worth the money. That if you want my advice, that's that's one of like many. <laughs> yeah. 
and for me for me person for me personally i um i would i would have done the airplane joke but i already did that when we did the when i was on the last call in with the with the aw watch party the jokes what the joke was done and for those wondering yes i was serious uh, yeah and no do not call me shirley now, all now being being all that it, being all that as it may, um, this is unfortunately another another one of another one of our entries that is in a growing that is in a growing list that I call awesome anime that 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 um funim that Funimation and the other and the other and similar higher ups don't want us to watch legally. Yes. Indeed. <clears throat> also, the also the list of why why we'll keep telling voice actors who who try to lecture me about piracy to get bent. Yeah, yeah. Your your ultimate your ultimate goal as an artist ha is is to have your art art displayed, regardless of how, of the legality or the money making situation. You made your money in the first place. They ain't paying you royalties on on a bit. Most shows you even get a royalty. So the fact is, your voice on something being pirated, and then they're not making money anyways. You should be fucking happy in your head place. Mm -hmm. And look, it's is it? Can you technically get physical copies of of what we're going to be talking about tonight? Yeah, if you got some, if you got some serious money to burn. Got the scratch? You can watch, but um. And if you're willing to risk the gamut of get of getting a DVD that's in the wrong language, because there were a few of them wrong that I language, found that were... wrong region, wrong everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, looking just looking here, essence of anime, Karis the prophecy, uh, DVD, and of course, Karis the revelation. Uh, this one is going for five hundred dollars. What? I rest my case. You just it went up again. Fuck. Like, there's one Couple showing weeks ago for was at four fifty. Yeah, there's one here showing for nineteen dollars, but I'm not sure if it's valid. Yeah, and going up, going on the used market with this kind of thing is gambling, and. Well, oh, it's from an o overstock. It's from Midwest overstocks. So, uh, there's no guarantee it's not damaged. Like I said, gambling. But speaking of that, we've danced around it enough. This week, we ended up watching a hidden gem that I feel more that I feel more people need to watch. Period. Especially if you are a fan of the darker end of Togusats. And while this isn't a Togusats, a lot of the spirit of that is present you it's, get a you, you get you get where a lot of influences uh, come from for sure from indeed this. because this because our most recent viewing was of karas indeed the and uh, the early two th the early 2000s work that was meant that was meant as a tribute to to the to the anniversary of Tatsunoko Productions, one of the yep. more venerable animation studios, who still who still does quite who still does quite a bit of work, and their catalog is nothing to sneeze at. Yeah, Tatsunoko Productions uh, has done a lot of very uh, recognizable names. In fact, uh, you have well. Kishan, and most people will probably recognize that more as Kishurn Sins, but Kishurn Robot Hunter is a very old and venerable series. You one have that, one that inadvert one that inadvertently led to the creation of a little known series called Mega Man. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it did. <laughs> Let's not forget that Kishurn is responsible for Mega Man. Um then you have the original Tekaman. Ah, which, now you see my language. 
the original Tekaman, not the Tekaman blade that everybody else knows. Oh no 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 no! I I've seen both. Both are awesome. Yeah, but you know, without Tatsunoko, we'd have neither. Tatsunoko has a lot of hidden gems that get over, of uh, you know, overshadowed by the more, um, I guess, mainstream things. And uh, Karis as a series, or as a mini-series, uh, six episodes of... Two years of six episodes. Thank you for production times. Mm, it killed me. I watched it episode by episode, people, as it was releasing because it wasn't you exactly poor bastard you poor bastard it's hey i did the same thing with the gundam unicorn ovas i waited three years for seven fucking ovas four years three years four years something got line um and it is very clearly a love letter to a lot of different things tatsunoko had done as well as a way to show how they were evolving because this was around the same time when things like DigiPaint and th more 3D modeling and and all of that stuff was happening in the anime sphere. And they fucking knocked it out of the park with this, what essentially amounts to a two-year tech demo that they then never took anywhere else besides a video game, which is also a great video game. Tatsunoko vs. Capcom is a fucking fantastic fighting game. But... Mon many people have described Karas as many things. One of those being Supernatural Batman, which we all can see why. Um, and it is a story that revolves around a lot of Japanese folklore. It's very involved with a lot of things that back in the early 2000s, most people, unless they were complete fucking nerds like me, knew nothing about. They didn't know what the fuck a, a kappa was. They didn't know uh, what the fuck a, a tsuchigumo was, or a kamaitachi, or a wanyudo. And it kind of shows in certain places in the English translation, which is what we watched. But, something I'd like to note, the English voice cast is a is a treasure chest of hidden gems you've got people like uh St <laughs> the main character the chorus otoha is steve staley and steve staley is known for people like uh oh let me see here who's a good one neji hiyuga from naruto or Fucking Griffith from 2016 Berserk! I'm sorry, I'm fine. I'm fine. Everything <laughs> hey, everything uh, is fine. Hey, Zan, uh, need a chill pill there, bud? No, I'm fine. I'm only You're absolutely fine. furious. <laughs> I'm fine. Yeah. As I'm a fine. fellow Berserk fan, I, sh I share his pain because I also had to sit through 2016 Berserk. Ironically... Yeah. Or I shouldn't say ironically. I should say coincidentally. Not uh, Steve Staley was not only the English voice for a main character in one of the animes that I waited two years to watch all the episodes was. He was also the English voice for Benadger Lynx in Gundam Unicorn. Steve, you're a curse. And I love you. But god damn it. <laughs> but but we, have, we have other people here too. Uh, we have Doug Stone who is known for some of his roles in Dynasty Warriors 6 as uh, Shizhu or Zhang Xiao. Um, or he was the voice of Psycho Mantis in Metal Gear Solid 4 and the graphic novel. Or, you know, he was Dayaka in the English version of Gurren Lagann. We have Doug Erholtz, who... Uh, for more recent people who have been watching things like Iron Blooded Orphans, he was Akihiro Altland. Uh, or he in Seven Deadly Sins, he was Slater. Or in uh, more Naruto, he's Asuma Sarutobi. We also have uh, some well -mo some well known names. We've got Mary Elizabeth McGlynn. Uh We've got 
Oh, who else do we have here? Uh, Melissa Fawn, who everyone knows as their favorite Ed from Cowboy Bebop. Everyone you mean, knows. You who mean Melissa the good Fawn Ed, unfortunately, for the live action one who actually pulled it off. Yep. And we I'll even die have... on that hill, by the way, but that's another story for another day. I know. I, I We even have Dave Wittenberg as one of the two uh, detectives you follow around in this story. But. The most hidden of hidden gems that you'll never notice unless you're looking for it. The main antagonist, Echo himself, this cold, arrogant, controlling man. He's that very shit, crazy, Kara's common writer thing that's gonna fuck everything up. Yeah, he's he's very oh. much a you you feel the villainy, and it's a powerful performance. What By a fucking heel. What a fucking heel. By none other than... Oinks! We're reading for it now, Scoops! Matthew <laughs> fucking Lillard! <laughs> the minute he told me that... Flo jaw floor. Anybody who wants to actually see Matthew Lillard's acting range, watch Chorus in English. Listen to the main fucking villain. I figured out it was Matthew Lillard by episode two, which reminds you was six apart, six months apart from from episode one. And I was like, "This has to be a lie. I am hearing things. This is not who I think it is." And it sure, is. fucking enough, it was. See, that's what happens when 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 Shaggy turns heel, goes Super Saiyan at the same Ultra goddamn instinct. time. Ultra instinct. Ultra instinct. Shaggy turning heel. Shaggy. Shaggy Rose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what I do find what I do find kind of amusing is that the the store the what this the the pro the the project was supposed to be a showcase of how far how far Tatsunoko Productions has come and where they pl and where they plan on going. We've established this, but apparently the uh, the pitch. Ended up shifting around like three times before we got what we ended up getting. Yeah. Because originally it was going to be similar to Dororo. Oh. He's trying to get his party parts back from from the Mikura, yeah. Um. Then, and at one at one point at one point it there was there there. There was the intent of having three leading he three leading heroes in the in the vein of a period drama. Oh, and then eventually we got the the superhero action horror that we en that we ended up seeing. The other thing, and I'm I'm this is one of those things that I'm curi I'm curious as to the reasoning as to why this was done. The dialogue is th the the dialogue and the way the story presents itself is going to be a bit di is going to be a bit different from what a lot of people are going to expect in this in the sense that it relies on a whole lot of inference based on what's shown. This this show in, in essence is intended for a Japanese audience. Like this was. The folklore that it, it relies heavily on the folklore that is known within the within Japanese soil. Now, it's not completely alienating. It's there's as we will, we will discuss. It is still very much enjoyable if you don't know every bar part, as it's not completely alienating, as I mentioned. But your mileage will vary as far as okay. What do you know of of Japanese folklore? Mm -hmm. Um, going to pause one moment. I'd like to take this moment to go over one of one pet peeve that I ended up ranting about early on, and that is the fact that the that a lot of the yokai are referred to in the dub as demons. I think I, I had a bigger bigger uh, reaction than you did, though. Yeah, you you were not too happy about that. I understand why this kind of thing was done, and 
Karas is far is far from the first offender with this because early episodes of Yu Yu Hakusho also are guilty of this. But Yokai are not demons in the way that we think of demons. In fact, it, it, it would be more accurate to say that the word demon, which is usually something like Akuma, uh, is either a subgroup within Yokai, which is a far, uh, far larger branching terminology that generally means mysterious beings or mysterious creatures uh or that in some cases demons are considered entirely separate from yokai mm -hmm. they also used fiends which is a little closer i suppose they used fiends, they used fiends later on and um but and i remember in the later seasons of yu yu Hakusho, show they they um started to drop the they started to distance themselves from demon and instead used apparition Yep. Which isn't quite on the mark but is closer. But this is one of the this is one of those things of the early it's important to remember that the early, that the early 2000s you had that you had this um early onset of a gold rush when it came to when it came to anime. And a lot of people were trying to find their footing. And a lot of terminology wasn't in the public consciousness yet. Uh, a lot of these days you can say to the generic anime community, oh yeah, that thing's a yokai, and they will understand what you mean. They will understand that you mean that this is some sort of mysterious, possibly supernatural creature from within Japanese folklore. Mm -hmm. But here, we had you know, the growing pains of the early 2000s. The other bigger... Oh my god! Uh... I'm fine, I'm fine. Uh, pet peeve I had was the Mikuda that are Echo's henchmen are all very specific yokai. You have a Kappa, you have a Tsuchigumo, you have a Kamaitachi, you have a Wanyudo, and you have a pair of Nue. And out of all of them, they do not refer to Kappa as Kappa, and he appears in the first episode. They refer to him as a water goblin. Which, while technically correct, and, uh, you know, if you're, if you're going to go with, with all the mythology, you might as well go with whole hog. Especially since the rest were called by their actual names. Which was obviously that that that's something they fixed in future episodes. Yeah, in the first episode, not so much. Yeah, but the the thing, but this is where one of the th one of the things that I want that I wanted to make clear is the in is when I said when I say that the that the script relies heavy on inference. One of the things that I mean by that is that. It does not go. It does not go into a whole lot of detail in a expository sense. <clears throat> in that We've, case, it's truly more show don't tell, which is good. Yeah, it takes that to it. It takes that to its furthest <sighs> extremes. Because they of, give you just enough. They give you just enough context to to understand. Okay, what this is what's going on. Who's doing what to the who now? But at the same time. They show you, like they take advantage of the massive production budget and the production time to show you as properly as possible. Mm -hmm. And what I do, what I do find kind of kind of amusing is it's a very bold move for the, for a whole new IP to. Do a cold open right out of right out of the gate, involving a pre involving Echo in a battle with a previous Karas, a very a very kick ass battle I should I should mention that shows just how ridiculous fights with um Karas are going to get. Considering that they oh. are both fighting as jets and transforming into people and then transforming back to jets. Maverick. <laughs> Sorry, I have to throw it up. 
MST3K joke in there, but you get the idea. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't take and he, after after that you have you have a long you have a significantly long stretch without without as much action and you're not even you're not even sure who the main protagonist is going to be. And that's part of the fun is figuring out who's going to be who. Mm -hmm. They don't they just don't they don't straight up tell you who's who, but they're giving you ideas of on possibilities, okay, who's going to step up in that sense. It, it it lends to a lot of world building. That be that being said, that being said, there there is the. I'd be remiss if I did if I didn't point out that one of the one of the main one of the main girls that we that we see throughout the series could probably be could probably be considered the unlucky the unluckiest person in in Japan. Oh yeah, her. <laughs> Izuru. Yeah, I Izuru. No, Chizuru. Chizuru. Yeah, oh, sorry. Because every time, every time that she's tr that she's just trying to make a living, she just happens to be in a place where supernatural shit is going to go down. Because after the after that cold open, it shifts into a murder mystery of these mysterious deaths and sand being involved in bathrooms. Mysterious deaths where people are completely exsanguinated, not just of blood, but all bodily fluids. Which you know what that you know what that means. The real culprit is ancient Egypt. Always ancient Egypt. <laughs> but they 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 know a lot of things, and there is a specific department for these types of cases. In the police, in the local Tokyo Metropolitan Police, known as the Intervention Department, headed by one detective who isn't even technically a detective. He's just, it, if you've ever heard of temporary deputization, it's kind of like that, except for years. Basically, he's, he's getting paid to sit on his ass and do Ghostbuster shit. Yeah. Without the technology. We, we are introduced to... First, Detective Kude, getting off a train to come and join the intervention department, who unfortunately has some stomach issues, which lead to him getting involved in one of these incidents as they're occurring. And when he meets the actual detective running the inter inter intervention department, a man named Minoru Sagisaka... <clears throat> Sagisaka is determined that this is caused by yokai. This has to be caused by yokai. Even and though Kude, everybody is looking at him, everybody is looking at him sideways. Yeah, everybody is looking at Sagisaka like he's crazy, and it all stems from something we haven't been introduced to yet. But Kude is is a skeptic himself. He doesn't know what happened, but he he does know that. Or at least he thinks he knows that yokai aren't real. Sagi Saka points out something very important. In all of these cases, each and every one of them, there is at least one survivor left behind. So they go to find the survivor and talk to her. And it just, and once again, it just, it just, it happens to be the same girl because. But because bad luck works that way. Almost killed selling Christmas cakes three years before the actual story begins. Uh, you know, ki almost killed in a bathroom where three other people were completely drained of their blood. It's it's not a good day for her. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, uh, we see another man walking around, uh, laying on top of trains as if and it's nothing. somehow not falling off. No, he, remember, he weighed down the blanket with rocks. On a train. On a train, yeah. On the roof of a train. It's, it's perfectly fine, Monk. Oh, yeah. Or I'm taller. 
Oh, sorry, wrong, wrong, wrong show, wrong movie. <laughs> but he, uh, he's also seen talking to the camera a lot, which is weird. You're like, is he breaking the fourth wall? Uh, and we learn uh, as those people are being drained in the bathroom, he is fighting something as well with some really slick gold guns. But then whatever he was fighting escapes down the, uh, a manhole. I wonder if he got those. I wonder if he bought those guns from Scaramanga's collection. Maybe. Ooh, maybe. And, and we learn that he is a traitor to the other Mikura. And the uh, perpetrator taunts him about coming and fighting him. And he's like, I'm not stupid enough to go down into the water with a kappa. <clears throat> Which is when you get the, the uh, particular feeling that not all is right with the world. But then we're introduced to a man who is bleeding out on a gurney. <laughs> And wheeled in in a coma into a ward where a white cat looks at him before this man finds himself in a fantasy world in front of a little girl with some cool goggles, cat ears, and a cat tail. She introduces herself as Yurine and asks him to make a covenant with her. And when he does so, well, they have hunting to do. Mm hmm. And at around this same time, there's, and this is this is this is a Chekhov's gun laid laid in the background, of a wrestler who's going to be doing a 100 man gauntlet. In an underground so, wrestling arena, by the way, it's 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 not just normal wrestling. So, I had an idea there. I was going to say Antonio Noki and Cage. <laughs> for, for those for those who know your Red Brown, Ra, your Red Brown and Lou Ferrigno movies, mm -hmm. and he and later on we do see we do see a bit of that, and it's um, it seems to start out normal, but then get but then gets into the level that you'd expect from an underground wrestling ring. Yeah, there's there's electric electricity. There's some explosives. There's weapons that are not, you know, normal weapons or well, wrestling weapons, but actual weapons. Mm -hmm. It's what you would expect if you were playing Yakuza Zero and going to the Coliseum. Quite. I and then we and then we get a chime that is. Go is going to be the harbinger for the for the remainder of this adventure. Yep. They they announce uh Suika is his name as a uh, as a wrestler for his next opponent to appear. And the uh, the opening goes off like you would have, you would expect from a wrestling opening, but nobody's nobody's in the doorway. And then they hear a voice counting before she announces, go, chorus. And we get a uh, transformation sequence straight out of fucking Garo. And, 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 and for those wondering, you up. Just you up. Just with it, just with a pocket watch instead of, instead of a, um, instead of, instead of a sword. Granted, the pocket watch does eventually turn into a sword. Mm-hmm. And everybody freezes in space. All the people are frozen. They can't move when Karis transforms. But then Suika starts moving. Uh, we see him grab the ring announcer, who's still frozen, and transform into this giant monstrosity of a thing. Part you organic. Ugly motherfucker. Yeah, basically. Part organic. Part mechanic, all horrific, and Karis charges him and takes him out of the arena. This is one of the this is one of those opening monster of the week kind of kind of fights meant to sh meant to showcase Karas. Which, let's be honest, it was fucking badass. Mm -hmm. He got he cut down uh, Kappa's water clone jutsu, a bunch of ninja water clone girls. Uh, he fought with 
Kappa, and Kappa says something here that is, if you weren't paying attention to what was happening when he grabbed the uh, the ringborn announce the, the ringside announcer, um, you wouldn't understand what he was saying. He says, "Now that I've got a full tank, I'm more powerful than ever," or something along those lines. Um, and when he grabbed the the ringside announcer. Long ribbons of red fluid flew from the announcer into the mechanical parts on his body. The mechanics on his body are powered by human blood. Which makes the, the whole harvesting blood thing that much more sinister. You mm -hmm. thought Dracula was, was rough. <laughs> you knew... But Karis in this whole thing is not even... He doesn't even blink. The man cuts down these clones, deals with all these moves from Kappa, moves faster than Kappa can comprehend even in his yokai Mikura form, and proceeds to, well, do what we would expect of any finisher from a tokusatsu. <laughs> cuts... Cuts the air, trapping the guy in a web of cuts. Transforms into a giant crow. Causes the, the moon to go through an ecliptic shift. Does an, uh, transforms his katana into a giant fucking cleaver. And proceeds to split the motherfucker in half. Mm -hmm. Because if you're going to kill somebody, you might as well do it in style, right? Yeah. And... With the with and that's how, that and that kind of leads to the aftermath of the first episode, which in a in a rare twist, I actually like the what the one episode the one um one worded episode titles in English as opposed to the actually I think I think all three I think all of the Japanese um episode titles are all three kanji. I'm pretty sure they're three kanji, but it's it's the same thing. They're very brief and have a very specific meaning. Mm -hmm. And for the f the first episode, it's referred to as Overture, which what? is an apt name. It's it's a the first episode is is packed with so many different things. Mm -hmm. uh, there's just so much uh, to to this that is is in this single episode um that it's probably one of the ones we're going to have to the only one we're going to have to go into this amount of detail on the english is overture uh, and the japanese is karasu kaigan or the karas awakens And episode two, it, episode two once again brings us back, brings us back to the building the pieces once again. And I think it was at this point where we started to delve a little bit further into a th into a theme that had that had been um, that had been present in the first episode, but never fully gone into, and that is the relationship between the supernatural life and the hu and the human life. Yeah, we actually see that um, yokai are, live amongst the people as well, and that was hinted at the very end of episode one, mm -hmm. where uh, the weird guy with the gold guns who fought Kappa first um, turns around and looks at the camera again, that, like he's been doing the entire episode, and says, "Are you still following me around?" And we find out it's this cute little childlike snail demon and there's a specific name for that particular yokai uh I, mm. there's a specific let me see here let me see if i can find it but while i'm finding it um so it was it was this whole you think he's breaking the fourth wall but he's not we're just seeing everything from this yokai's eyes mm -hmm. and 
at, first at the end of the first person yokai. Yep, and that's also um, at the end of that episode. Uh, Kude and Sagi Saka are standing outside of the of the wrestling arena, investigating this dead ringside announcer and missing wrestler, and a sudden shower occurs. And while it's it's said kind of poorly in the English version, the the meaning is still there. Sagi Saka tells Kude, they say that when a sudden shower occurs, that's when the yokai are around. And then the aspects shift, and you see all the yokai mixed amongst the people. The other thing that we end up seeing is that the ma the man who transformed into Karas has an has another duty, that being as a doctor in this sanctuary-like place. Or at least the appearance of one, lab coat and all. Yep, he is, they, and they call they even call him Dr. Karis. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, he do, he he is seen giving medicine to to sick yokai. Mm -hmm. But when th but within 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 that, you do we end up seeing. A little bit of the other, the other, the other um, forces of the enemy who are who I believe by this point we knew them we knew them as Mikura. Yes, the the ones who have joined Echo. Yeah, they are the Mikura. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go full. It doesn't go full into who who Echo is. It's just just that they have a just that they have a plan. Mm -hmm. uh, and. As for the little snail spirit wearing the yellow raincoat, that's in Amewarashi. They're uh, a yokai that arises from the emotions of being separated from parents. Uh, they tend to manifest as boys wearing rain gear. Back in feudal Japan, it was boys wearing the normal grass overcoat and, and straw hat. Uh, obviously, in modern day, it's then believed that they moved to the uh, yellow... Um, you know the yellow the the yellow plastic o over raincoats that most children wear in in Japan. But, uh, with all of this, um, the. The second episode, like, is introducing us to Karis's other other uh, responsibilities, and it also shows us that um, the Mikura aren't just focused on gathering blood; uh, they are also focused on causing terror. Every time they attack, it's always to scare and get blood. Yeah, because again, there's there all there always seems to be this inferences of a bigger plan at work, mm -hmm. and that's some that's something that we that's something that we're seeing more and more of. And one of the other one of the other Mikura decides, hey, I think I, I think I'm going to take a crack at taking out Karas. Yep, this Mikura is Wan Yudo. And Wan Yudo, for people who are unaware of what type of yokai those are, are a giant flaming wheel with a monk's head at the center. Uh, you may have seen this if you've ever played Castlevania games. They're a pretty common enemy. <laughs> relation to Pinwheel from Dark Souls, however. No relation, no. And by um, the way, not not our monk, a different monk. Lord there, knows you're not getting my head on a wheel. N not without getting a few scars. But the other, th but one of the other things that's revealed during this is, first off, the identity of our 
um, of our vagabond. Yep. Our, du our we... dual pi our dual pistol vagabond. He is Nue, and he ends and in the aftermath of the fight with with Juan Yudo, he ends up losing. He ends up losing control of himself and and revealing that he's also a Mikura. Yep, but it's also that's because Juan Yudo injured him. Mm -hmm. And as Karis is about to take him down, uh, the little uh, Amewarashi shows up and stops him and says, "He's not bad. Please don't." Um, Nue escapes, and Car and Yurine is even like, "Why didn't you kill him?" And Karis is like. Didn't seem bad. <laughs> he's got a brain. He's not brainless. He, he's using his brain to discern, okay, this is a bad guy a good guy? And he goes, he's not causing harm. Why would I kill someone that's not causing harm? But of course, this whole thing also resulted in Juan Yudo. Well, let's, let's just say that uh, he's, there's, a, there's an old proverb, rolling stones gather no moss. Uh, he's going to be gathering moss for eternity. No. But it's at Go ahead. Uh, it's at this point that Echo and the other Mikura uh, notice that this car seems to be a lot more competent than previous. Uh, and they're like, we need to stop him. And Echo's like, don't worry, I know my own greatest weakness since I've been Karis of Tokyo for over 400 years. Uh, we'll yeah, just exploit that. that bud. Because this is where we have the revelation of it's because it is in episode three where we have the rev, where we have a bit of revelation. And this, there, we had been leaning into a bit of a superhero thing for the first two episodes. Episode three leans a little bit more into a horror story. One that happens to take place at a hospital. <laughs> Two hospitals. Mm -hmm. But and I believe I believe Kamai Tachi and Suchigumo end up end up taking their part into in this particular scheme. Yes. Um, Suchigumo makes a very big ruckus at a hospital. Um, one of one of two hospitals that. Uh, the policeman had been investigating earlier in the day. They'd been asked to investigate. Strangely. And Karis shows up there to fight her. And it's a really cool piece. It's like a really cool set piece. They're fighting in the hospital. He's transforming between jet form and normal to chase her around using a grappling hook to kick, carry himself around corners and stuff. It yeah, it's is fucking awesome. It's fucking brutal. And uh and they get to the roof and uh it's at that point that they realize this is a decoy all along. Kamai Itachi is at the other hospital where Otoha's real body is. So it's at this point that we also realize that Karis is a completely spiritual being. Um, Otoha does not transform into Karis, his soul does. And if his body were to die, well... Well, he fucking dies. He, he fucking goes, bye-bye. Uh, so, with that... Um, so a very, very much in the same vein as a Madoka Magica kind of thing. <laughs> With that, Yurine is like, wait, it's a trap. We have to go before they can kill Tsuchiguma. And Karis rushes off um, to this hospital. Now, the Amewarashi is also at this hospital trying to get blood from one of the blood banks. To give to Nue, who is still harmed and needs blood to be restored. Get heal. Yeah. And he sees Kamaitachi here and freaks out as he's sneaking away from the guy and sees Otoha's body, which is actually what first uh, warned Yurine 
And just before Kamaitachi can cut up Otoha's body, uh, Otoha bashes him in from behind with his jet form. <laughs> but he also sees his own body and kind of freaks out for a second before fighting Kamaitachi further. But you see, that's not everything. This was a trap within a trap. Yurine comes to Karis for his, or comes with Karis for his exterminations. She has to. She has to be present for him to manifest his power. And Echo knows this. And Echo knows that he ha that Yurine has to stay outside of the line of fire. Tsuchigumo knows where they're going to be. And so Tsuchigumo does uh, uh, some of that. I know where this is going because I've seen too much hentai shit. And stuffs blood threads down Yurine's throat. And uh, detransforms Otoha. Essentially, by stripping him of Yurine's power. Nue shows up to stop Kamaitachi from killing Karis, but Nue is still hurt. And just before Kamaitachi can kill Amewarashi, can kill Nue, Otoha's real comatose body wakes up, picks up the, the sword of Karis that had dropped out of his hand as he detransformed. It's still around. It's, it's still physical. And just fucking mercs. Like, this is normal human Otoha cutting Kamaitachi in half. Ladies and gentlemen, beast mode engaged. Which is saying, ironic that he ends up cutting the, the yokai that's obsessed with cutting things. Yeah, for those who don't know what a Kamaitachi is, it's a razor weasel, literally. It's a weasel with kama for arms. Kama being the short sickles that I think everybody at this point uh, ubiquitously knows in the anime community. And also can travel as fast as the wind. And is known for cutting you. Oh, is it known for cutting you? It Quite is the literally. It is the edgiest boy. So he just made an edgy boy edgier by ending him with an edge. You know... I'd make an edge joke, but I'm not. You could you could do it yourselves now. It's you in your head. You know no, him. Go ahead. Damn nope. it, Monk! I was trying to be, you know. I'll make I'll make I'll make a better edge joke, and it's not even about edge. Ow, the edge. <laughs> ah, <laughs> nice. I mean, very nice. But wouldn't you whole... wouldn't you say Kamaitachi was black and red at the end there? <laughs> little bit, little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Although, two things. One, that's what you get for speaking in auto tune. <laughs> whether the Ooh. and whether the and I will appreciate because I've because I've watched this both dub and sub. It's same both. Yeah, it's same both, and in both cases, subtitles are provided because he's meant to sound somewhat unintelligible. Because he has literal blades for his throat, Monk. That's why. His neck is made of razor blades. Yeah. And truth be told, the truth be told, the design of Kamaitachi, it feels like something I'd see Sam Raimi do. The design of Kamaitachi feels like a missing Cenobite from Hellraiser. I can go with that, you too. You know, anyone getting that android dude from the one of the... Uh... Dragon Ball Z Bridge movies, Android 13 specifically, that robot. <laughs> or Android, whatever. Truckerbot? What? <laughs> Close There's, enough. Where's my trucker hat? There exactly. you go. <laughs> exactly. But it is with the close of episode three that we finish the Prophecy DVD. If we were tracking by DVDs, the first half is the prophecy and the second half is called the revelation. And this is where the monster of the week format, the going from monster monster thing goes backstage to expand on the world and lead to the final battle. But one of 
the first thing the first thing to note is that without the, without that um without that covenant with Yurine, Otoha is 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 a bit directionless. And 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 as we go through the as we go through the process of piecing together of him piecing together his own past, events from his own past we end up seeing we end up seeing that through through a through a bit of flashbacks and the and it almost turns into a um a gangster movie well quite it quite literally turns into that because you're dealing with the yakuza because you see Otoha was a it was and it was a yak was first off the the ch the child of a yakuza boss one one for, one that one whose parentage would prompt a weird owl song eh but also one one with a very with a significant defect but it's never referred to as a defect he's just called a demon because he feels no fear and no pain which made him the perfect enforcer and so and, for those who are looking for uh, for out of anime reference think of Renard from uh, the world is not enough yeah he in had, that he sense had, feels no pain feels almost nothing essentially he has CIP um congenital insensitivity to pain yep it is a, it is a literal defect in his body mm -hmm. and Nui and a few others suggest that th that he finds the people important to him uh, as part of finding out what he needs to do, and it's that's when he remembers what led to him getting hospitalized in the first place. The only person he cared about in the Yakuza was a, a little bro character, uh, and they were gonna go to New Zealand and get out of the Yakuza. But to do it, they had to steal some yakuza money. And you know how the you know how the yakuza is with their money. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And for those wondering, they're the same as any mafia. Worse, nope. the... at least in punishment wise. Not fair. I mean, in in the mafia, they just fucking kill you. <laughs> the yakuza, they make it last. They make it last, or they make you cut off your own fingers, or wait, I'm I'm. There's a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. But we we learned that what happened was they've stole some money from one of the Yakuza safe houses, one of their business ventures, but got caught. And before they could shoot uh, Otoha's little brother character named Ryuji, who is voiced by none other than Johnny Yongbosh. Uh, Bosh, but whatever. I call it Bush because it's funny. Come on now. <laughs> I know. Okay, Tris Cherko, you could you you you, you know whatever. <laughs> but I mean, I could call him Chris Cherico. Ah! But that's a different story. <laughs> I don't think um, I don't think Johnny's Canadian enough for that. <laughs> but he he realizes that he was basically left for dead, but that they wouldn't leave Ryuji off so much. And so he goes on, well, the thing he does best. A killing spree. Murder! He finds Ryuji, unchains him, picks him up, says we're going to escape after all. And as they're escaping, Ryuji... Boom! Headshot. Yeah. Boom. Headshot. Yes. Uh, Ryuji... Ryuji suddenly has an open mind. Quite literally, in some cases. But the thing, of course, it, of course, the culprit is the, is their for, is their former boss. Where yep. it, and this is, and he goes all in on the whole on the whole thing of Otoya being a de, being a demon who shouldn't have been born to begin with. Yep, Otoha is a uh, Otoha is now you you mentioned him as the son of a boss, which is a slip because 
because he was only known as the brother of the boss initially. Uh, Otoha is the product of incest between the mob boss and the mob boss's mom, which is what likely attributes to his congenital insensitivity to pain. And they stare each other down and be, and uh, his brother slash father slash um, has one gun trained on him but puts it down by his side but then pulls out another gun on him like I'm gonna kill you you son of a bitch and Otoha cuts off the barrel of the gun as well as his arm and just leaves mm-hmm. finds a, a nice uh, roof to, bro- to uh, brood on Wondering, you know, what he's going to do. While all of this is happening, Nue is infiltrating uh, Echo's tower. And he gets to Echo. Echo slams him down into this central area. Before where... we even get into that, there's one, there is one thing that we, sh- that we, should, we should dip into regarding Nue and why he why he is why he's in Tokyo yes he tells this to the Amewarashi actually mm-hmm. uh, when the Amewarashi says he's gonna go get him blood um that he came back to uh Tokyo to get his little brother who echo had and something important that uh new a Nue said is that everybody who joined Echo joined Echo because they were tired of being forgotten. And it's it's with this that we're starting to see that uh, the reasons Echo wants to bring terror to Tokyo is due to the fact that they're forgetting yokai. They're forgetting... <laughs> Even even when this this anime was first being made, I was like, that's eh, a bit of a stretch. <laughs> and if we, anybody we, has... had a, we had a conversation about this because despite the <laughs> despite the despite the appearances of secularity, that's really not the case with Japan. It's not a full. I wouldn't say it's a full on theocratic state, but the 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 religious presence is still extremely strong and i'd say the i'd say the greatest case in point with this involves a certain stone that got broken that caused a lot of people to freak the fuck out which is it's from our perspective it could be it could be easily seen as a haha thing that was not the case over yeah. there so so first of all since this does play, take, take place in tokyo let's address tokyo Tokyo is a very metropolitan-looking city. There's lots of skyscrapers, lots of lights, lots of glass. Very artsy architecture in lots of the city. And very, very sectional, too. Like, one section of the city is high class. The other section of the city is Weebville. The other section of the city is mom-and-pop shops. It makes you feel like you're in a rustic village in the middle of fucking Tokyo. And one section, and one is, section, is, and is, one section is porno. Hey, 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 we can't tell any of the Rapongi stories. We'll get kicked off of YouTube. What, stays, <laughs> what, what happens in Rapongi stays in Rapongi. <laughs> hey, that's why I kept it very simple. You but can you say the word say porno much? without getting yanked off of YouTube. Mm-hmm. For now. This is, this is true. You were saying like, one section is what? <laughs> well played. <laughs> but, uh... You were about to say one section was what, Monk? Um, I was gonna say that one section we uh, one section is the one is the one that we can't we can't talk about and uh, and <laughs> then and okay yeah all right but there's also a there is an entire ward within Tokyo that is a temple ward it is full of Shinto shrines, Buddhist temples, and the like. And that's just one ward. There are, and this is accurately portrayed in the game Ghostwire Tokyo, in just uh, in just Shibuya alone, 
There are multiple little Shinto shrines, Tori gates, everything, everywhere. This this country, its culture. Monk said it's not a theocracy. Monk is partially right. I mean, it's when not I a say, theocracy. When I say it's not a theocracy, I mean it's not the Vatican. The Vatican this is, is true. The, the Vatican is a is an outright theocracy. It is a full on religious state yes japan has its diet which is like a parliament it's it's a it's a gathering of elected officials that hopefully represent their people well and make decisions for the country they have a prime minister <laughs> hey the japanese diet does better than than the pms in in canada the the uh, congress in the u.s or, or the pms in the uk <laughs> Why but, do you think uh, they're corrupt? We don't pay them too well. But on top of this system of secular law, you have the imperial family. And the imperial family has always been considered descended from God. They are directly, uh, through their lineage, Linked in blood to the sun goddess Amaterasu herself. That is the belief of Japan. And there is a reason that every fucking year, at every fucking uh, sowing festival, as in sowing seeds in the ground, and the emperor goes out and sows a seed, and sows a field with seeds himself. There is a reason that every harvest season, the emperor goes out to a, to a rice paddy and harvests rice himself. They do that to appease the gods. This goes all the way to their top of government. So that's why I laughed when Echo said that they were forgetting yokai. Because, and finally, the, the last story, the one we mentioned, the Seshoseki, a, st a stone that a Buddhist monk allegedly sealed the, the uh, legendarily infamous... Nine-tailed kitsune tamamo no mai. No, not that one, you idiot. Stop jerking off to your JPEGs. <laughs> I know you love fake Grand Order, but it's not that tamamo. Stop, yeah. wasting, your, stop <laughs> wasting your money, you fucking whales. Yeah, just go, <laughs> just go right-click. It's just like NFTs. Just go right-click. <laughs> but uh, th this, this stone at the beginning of March broke. And... The scientist said, oh, it's probably just erosion, you know, like most rocks. The, the, entire, the entire area of Nara was like, uh, are we all going to die? And the local government of Nara, not even prompted by the upper government, just the local government of Nara, went to the local Shinto temple and be like, can you, can, can you please go, go do something to make sure nothing bad happens? And an entire cavalcade of Shinto priests went and, and performed a purification and exorcism ceremony around this giant rock that split. Because that everybody was afraid. Because afraid. every scientist says, well, yeah, they'll split eventually. That's erosion. Every, anyone that's spiritual, we're all going to die. We're all going to, you know, it's the end of the world, people. It's, it's, not, it's not over yet, in case you haven't noticed. Oh. Yeah. Maddie, you missed a golden opportunity to to cosplay as King Ross. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the end is night. The end is night. Fucking run away. The end is night. Night. Yep. And, and <laughs> I remember during this whole Sesho Seki part, I tweeted out who had killed by thousand year old imprisoned uh, nine tailed Kitsune on their apocalypse bingo card. Put your fucking hands down. No, you didn't. <laughs> no one did. I did, but that's just because I'm a weeb. Yeah. That's on. That's been on my apocalypse card since I learned what the Sesho Seki was. Yeah. But the reason why we bring this kind of thing up is one of the major themes is this idea that at that um that a a bigger and bigger encroachment of technology, which the relationship between technology and people is something that anime has been exploring for decades ever se ever since the ever since the cyberpunk movement of the 80s 
I mean, I would argue that it's been the basis for anime. Osamu Tezuka created Astro Boy because of fucking nukes. Yeah, but there's always you look th you look through a, you look through a lot of a lot of works, some by Tatsunoko and some by others, and there's always there is always an undercurrent of of what technology and modern and modernization will do, will do for people. And I I feel this actually culminated in a in a toku in a toku uh, that we all know and love, Common Rider Zero One. Mm -hmm. yeah. That one talks about technological singularity. Yeah, but. In relation to Karis. By the way, I just thought up of a thing for, for later, but I'll put that in Parliament. Mm -hmm. All right. But then, in, yeah. in, in relation to Karis, uh, the encroachment of technology is seen as something taking away from the understanding of the spiritual. And it is with that technology that Echo is trying to make yokai more real. Um, the Mikuda manifest physically. They can be they, pictures of them can be taken. They can be seen without having to spe expend effort to manifest themselves. And that was actually something I thought was a really cool line by uh, by Nui. He said, "One of the perks of being a uh, one of the perks of becoming this way is we can actually have pictures taken of us." And he shows a picture of him and his little brother. Which at the same time, it's this is also where it's brought up that Nue are always born as twins. Yep. Which I think was specific for this uh, show because Nue being born as twins is not in every piece of folklore about them. It's in a couple, mm -hmm. and it's a much more obscure piece of fiction of folklore. I shouldn't I shouldn't say fiction because it is folklore. It's not just one type of fiction. It's a very specific type. Um, it, it is brought up in a few folklore stories, but not not a lot. Nue are usually a singular entity, or sometimes they're packs of entities. Ah, mm -hmm. uh, Neo and the <laughs> Nue. But the point the point is is that given given the, given the given how strong the reaction was with that, that's that's. And I'm, pro I'm probably Cyloning, and I do apologize because the Discord is only for in. it's only for a few seconds. But the the whole th the whole thing of a fe of a fear of being for of a fear of being forgotten is a bit ludicrous when you when you think about it from that angle when you think about it in that context. Yeah, if. If these were folklore entities from the U.S. who were fading away, fearing that they were being forgotten in some place metropolitan, say like I don't know, New York, I, I could believe that. I could absolutely believe that. Mm -hmm. um, not in more of the rural areas of the U.S. Most of the rural areas still have a lot of folklore and superstition. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But so, definitely in some place metropolitan. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there, oh, there's there were plenty there were plenty of old there were plenty of old folk tales that I that I grew up with, just just in my part of Minnesota. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, but through, the, but but it but anyways when it came, when it came to when it came to um, New Way deciding to make it make his move, um, I think it, I th it's at this point that it's revealed that even even New Way making an assault was was something that they had accounted for. Yep, because they accounted Echo for it. Is clearly trying to be trying to do a Xanatos gambit. No, not trying. Echo succeeded. His Xanatos gambit act actually and absolutely succeeded. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just Otoha. Well, we'll get to that. <laughs> um, so they managed to trap Echo, and or I mean, they managed to trap Echo. Manages to trap Nue down in this central area that we had seen him looking at his at his Udine, Echo's Udine, the one that's been with him for four hundred years. 
uh, earlier in in a previous episode, he was looking at his Udine trapped in this technological prison where she had tubes sticking out of her and shit. So that he could be the one to decide when he transforms and when he it gets to be Karis. And um, Nue is dragged down to this area. And he knew that uh, a Udine was a Karis's weakness. And so uh, Nue feigns that he's still weak and unconscious and then kills Echo's Udine. To which Echo starts laughing. And he says, I didn't have the heart to kill her, but now I am free. And he picks up the, the same stopwatch that, that we'd seen Otoha using for transforming, shoves it into his own chest. We see he has a mechanical eye and a mechanical left leg. And as he shoves it into his own chest, the mechanical eye becomes much more pronounced and like right there in front of you. Mm -hmm. uh, his body becomes more mechanical, and he says, "Now I am the one who chooses." And uh, he, you see the the same Buddhist uh, mantras in, uh, you know, Chinese characters appearing behind him that we would see in some of the earlier cars transformations as he's doing all of this, and then. Uh, Tsuchigumo, and, who is still alive and still here, and uh, Echo kill uh, Echo's own body, because he still had his own body, but by merging himself with technology and spirituality like he did the Mikura, he separated his soul from his body and made it physical. Mm -hmm. And then um, they also kill Otoha's Yurine. And as they do this, uh, the sword of Karas that Otoha had been carrying, because um, he had been told by another Karas from another city and her Yurine that uh, his Yurine wasn't dead, that the that the covenant was still intact. He just had to get her to br to to bring it back. But his sword cracks and gets a bunch of cracks in it. That same uh, that same other Karas. Um... Seems seems to have a unique relationship with their urine, in the sense that she re that she really wants to step in, but urine, but her urine is like is like no, we're observations. You're gonna sit back and watch. That 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 happens constantly. Mm -hmm. Also, burgers for one for whatever reason, there is always snackage. She, she yeah she was eating ice cream burgers uh different drinks everything she yeah. she, she liked food mm -hmm. sure way to a cruise is, is there, there's gotta be a chorus for a cruise line where she'd be like unlimited food yeah it's, it's yeah. the one it's the one cruise joke folks I'm mm -hmm. just gonna leave it there <laughs> But uh, that's the end of episode four when his sword cracks up. Because this is also the point where Echo takes Nue, throws him into the center of this giant machine that is his, his little brother. His little brother is very big, but is younger than him. Um, and is used to power a machine. He also throws Tsuchigumo in there. She's like, oh, I could still be useful. And then we hear her screaming horribly because she's torn to bits to power the machine. Mm -hmm. um, and this causes these giant snake-like tendrils to burst out of the ground in Tokyo and create a circle of towers. The Tower of Kappa, the Tower of Wanyudo, the Tower of Kamaitachi, and the Tower of Tsuchigumo which are all focusing spiritual energy while at the same time using these giant spiked tendrils to harvest human blood. Mm -hmm. And it's at this point that uh, you start seeing where things are going real bad. Um, because of the shit disaster. Shit hits the fan. This is like the fourth time in a row shit has hit the fan. Mm -hmm. It's like shit hit the fan, and then there was another fan blowing that shit back into the first fan over and over again. Yeah. Oh, let's put it this way. 
we there, this has been a series of hit, shit hitting fans, but now no, this one, yeah, it, it really hits the industrial fan there. Yeah. When we and do the so, tsunami, when we do the tsunami calls, sometimes I've had a running gag of saying, "This week's theme: things get worse." Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In yep, fact, yep. every time, every time at the end of the show, I would show would probably bust out that that same joke. Shit has hit the fan. Mm-hmm. Yep. And with with that in mind, uh, Otoha is still he's still lost. He still doesn't know exactly what he wants to do. The one person he cared about is now dead. One of his most hated people probably died when he chopped off their arm because, I mean, unless you get to a hospital real, real quick, you're going to exsanguinate real fast. Yep. Um, and so on and so forth. He's kind of wondering this ruined world because now all this stuff is happening. And he finds and protects a little girl whose mother has been drained dry um, and takes her with him to one of the shelters that has been going around. Uh, one of the shelters that this that the chief of police, who we haven't really gotten a good feeling about, is um has helped has helped plan out and set up. Um the chief of police has been kind of he's always told Kude that we need a skeptic like you in the intervention department. Um but then when Kude in this episode is like, wow, these these shelters and everything you set up and I, and I can't believe that it was all right all along. He's like, well, why do you think I set up the intervention department? They've always looked down on me for it, but, uh, you know, this one day, this day would come and they go and get Sagi Saka's uh, daughter out of, out of her hospital. Uh, Cause she's been, so, Oh yes, that's an important point. Mm-hmm. Sagi Saka's daughter is the entire reason Sagi Saka started believing in yokai and studying them and, and became an official, deputized member of the Metropolitan Police Department. And his daughter was one of the survivors of an attack. As we pointed out all the way at the beginning, uh, no matter what, when one of these yokai attacks would occur, there'd be one survivor, at the very least. And usually the the most as well. But uh, Saki Saka's daughter, uh, Michidu, I believe her name was, Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, was one of these. So they go and get her out of the hospital and get her to one of the the bunkers as well, along with the chief of police and a few others. Asagi Saka actually gets a sideline finding more yokai. And he's like, they're real! They're really real! Um, but before he gets back to, to the shelter, uh, Otoha shows up there, Kude shows up there, Chizuru, the unluckiest girl in the world, shows up there. <laughs> Um, and they're all talking to each other because they've all incidentally met and kind of touched each other's lives as they go around doing this. And uh, the police chief starts telling the people, yeah, we accounted for this. We, we, we arranged for this. Those things won't break through here because I made a deal with Echo. He, he literally says that. I made a deal that we would need to keep people safe. That he couldn't have everybody. And this is when you find out that there was another Mikuda. <sighs> mm-hmm. A giant bull demon. The Ushi Oni. Yep. And he's, he's at his limit. He hasn't had blood in forever. He's been stuck in his human form as the chief of police for forever. And these little areas that he asked Lord Echo to keep safe were so he could have a fucking feast. And uh, Sagi Saka shows up at the very end of his transformation and goes, what's going on? Get her out of here. And this is also where we learn that Michiru survived an attack from Ushi Oni. So, people are freaking out. Otoha has saved this little girl, but asks Kude and Chizuru to take her while he slowly approaches uh, Ushioni. And there's actually a really cool fight, even in this underground area, between Ushioni and Otoha as a human! 
he he does things like blocking fireball blasts from him and jumping on him and stabbing him in the eye and shit. But eventually, Otoha as a human with a sword that is cracked can only do so much. Mm-hmm. And they're up on the streets of Tokyo in the middle of one of the larger intercourses, intersections. Freudian slip, probably. <clears throat> larger larger intersections where uh, Ushioni charges up a very large blast and shoots it at Otoha. The sword breaks. He gets fragments of metal in his eye, and they they actually animate this shit real well. Yeah, he gets that's, an ear. that's something that makes some people squeam. He gets shards oh, of metal yeah. in his eye. One of his ears gets torn off. Half of his left arm goes missing, and he's bleeding out. Mm-hmm. But he's in the middle of this this intersection. And Ushioni is like, I can't believe you even blocked that, but now your sword's all broken. What are you going to do, boy? And charges up another fireball. And uh, at that point, there the you see there's a whole bunch of other chorus. Not just the... The Kansai Ben speaking chorus that we, uh, she does speak Kansai Ben in, in, Jap- in, in the Japanese, and she speaks uh, with hick inflections on her words, not actual southern accent, but like actual Which y'all and things like mi- that. I personally don't mind. I've, we've seen some other anime where the interpretation for a Kansai Ben accent is to go full on southern drawl at times. Yeah. No, this is just the type of. If you've ever lived in a small town in in parts of the Midwest, and people shortcut some of their words, they have certain words that are, you know, they're they're derivations of normal words in English that make sense to them. She kind of talks like that at times. Um, but there's a whole bunch of other chorus just hanging around watching this battle. Um, and. When he gets hit by the fireball and he's about to go down, this one chorus that has been helping him, she's like, I'm going to go down there and i got to stop the fireball and i got to help him out. And her yurine goes, wait. She's like, what? She's like, a yurine is about to be born. And uh, it's it's here we see, and I pointed it out to the guys mm-hmm. going back a few a few seconds in the episode just to show them. The blood splatter from the road that he was shot down with the first fireball leads to the center of this intersection, and the center of this intersection looks like the center of a Buddhist mandala in a way. And I'm like, I.e., bad guy fuck up, big guy, good guy about to be get a like some sort of mystic seal, mm-hmm. some sort of. So spiritual marking and it's marked in a whole bunch of Otoha's blood and anyone who knows anything about supernatural shit knows you mark a seal in blood shit's about to get crazy uh, and so a whole bunch of crows show up every white cat in the fucking city it seems shows up they all start glowing gold mm-hmm. and uh, Yurine, a new Yurine is literally born out of Otoha. And uh, she tells him that he lives because the city loves him. Mm-hmm. And he loves the city. And now he has something to do. And so with that, he is restored as Karas. Or as I like to call him, Shin Karas. Because... Gone is the mostly black armor that he had with some gray trim. No, no, no. That gray trim has all turned into gold trim. Mm -hmm. And holy shit, does that denote a power-up or what? (laughs) He, Ushioni shoots his second fireball, but it barely gets very very far before Karis rushes through it. And Ushioni tried uh, tried to kill the metal. The metal will live on. Um, I should I should note that in the midst of this, even the yokai who, at the very least, were somewhat sympathetic to Echo's cause up to this point, are having buyer's remorse because 
what he ended up doing what with with fucking this with fucking up the city in the way that he did it um oddly enough it's made the it's made the it's made the problem that the yokai have been having worse yeah there's a part where there's a group of yokai including the little uh amewarashi who are in yurine's world talking about what is echo doing he said he was doing it for the yokai etc etc and this little amewarashi speaks up and goes no we just like we rely on the humans the humans rely on us if either of us goes out we both die and he holds up his hand and it's turning transparent mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and uh echo they, just wants they, to basically folks echo is trying to be a pull a seth roth just without a big fucking asteroid sort of ish uh I'm trying but, to be a layman. I'm yeah. trying to keep it under for the lamos, you know, because I'm I, a lame I, I, <laughs> I can get, I can get that. Um, truth be, truth be told, I'd, I'd if I'm getting, if I'm gonna be making Final Fantasy villain comparisons, um, I'd say, I'd say that he, I'd say that he's got more in common with Kuja. Ah, fair. Mm-hmm. But, uh. The, the, even these demons eventually leave Yurine's world and go to the surface to try and help out somehow. Mm-hmm. Um, and people start seeing them, too. And this didn't seem very... Uh, this didn't seem like very important. They just A lot of people who watched this in English just figured, oh, what Echo's doing is weakening the, the bounds between the, the mortal realm and the spirit realm, and now people can see yokai. But the actual writer and directors... They both said in an interview that yokai in the Karis world aren't something people can just automatically see if they're spiritually aware enough. Yokai only show themselves to people that they implicitly and completely trust. They do not show themselves to people they don't trust, period. End of story. So the fact that people could start seeing yokai without that happening was something much more drastic than it first seemed. Um, and during the fight with uh, Ushioni, even though Karis beat him, uh, stuff like shattering glass happens because big explosions, fireballs, supersonic jets, etc. Mm-hmm. And it's and it's about to fall on Kure Chizuru. Uh, Michiru and uh, and the little girl who remains nameless throughout the entire story. Yeah. Uh, and a a casa casa. Uh, I forget the full name, but it's it's an umbrella demon with one foot, hmm. an umbrella yokai with one foot. Uh, pops up, opens up his umbrella and spins it. Um, because he had seen. Uh, Karis and Jetform do the same thing earlier to block other stuff. And the other demons gather around him like, Woo! What, what, do you think you're Karis now? It's like, no, I just felt like I had to do something. And then uh, K- Kuri et al. are looking at him and the others and like, you, you can see us? They actually ask that. Yeah. <laughs> and something I, sh- something I should note is that with episode with episode six, that's where we kind of have this culmination, and a, a large part of episode six is dedicated to wrapping up loose threads, including the, including the fact that one of that one of the other higher ups on, on the police that we saw was in league was in league with what with um, Echo and ends up being just a casualty. Uh, he wasn't a, that that guy actually wasn't a policeman. That was the governor of Tokyo. All right, my bad. My bad. The point. The point is, he ends up being a casualty in the in the in the larger f- fight. Yeah. Um. He, his his vice governor is all like, "We need to help the people. What's going on?" And the governor basically tells him, "I don't care. Let them kill everybody." My my. Uh, he's like, "But what about your family?" And he's like. My wife was a whore fucking a younger man, and my daughter was a whore fucking around as a, as a child. So I killed them both. The governor of Tokyo had gone. Bye bye. Dude was fucking flipped. Lost his uh, goddamn marbles. 
Mm-hmm. Yep. And he even shot his vice governor in the arm. He tried to shoot him in the head, but his vice governor, you know, managed to dodge as two giant spiritual guys turned into jets, crashed into the building. <laughs> and then one of them chained themselves to the other, and that chain was dragged through the entire top of the building, which cut it in half, killed the governor, and the vice governor is falling. And Kara saves him. Mm-hmm. He's like, I'll save you. You're a human. I have to save you. Yeah. The... <clears throat> But even throughout that, the the first off, there's the whole thing of of summoning a white dragon, which was essentially using the the ten the tendrils from all over the city to surround a bullet train. Or, yep, or he turned at the very least. He turned a train. It was. I'm pretty sure it was a Shinkansen. Um, but he turns it into a white dragon, which is a is a reference to some of the dragon ley line stuff uh, folklore in Japan mm-hmm. and how dragons sleep underneath the seats of power and such. And honestly, it reminded me way too much of X 1999. I was like, why are we doing this again? Why am I here just to suffer? Yes. Fuck off. <laughs> Dude. I'll make you suffer with me. I'm a wrestling fan. I'm born to suffer. <laughs> Yeah, but you're also not only that, but you're a Sens fan. <laughs> Habs fan, so that's even worse right now. Yeah, but you you don't have to live in the eternal torture of knowing that X nineteen ninety nine will never have an ending. We've already covered that. I'm good, Monk. What is your answer whenever I ask you why? Because, because God it applies cur- here too. <laughs> because God has cursed me for my hubris and my work is never finished. Exactly. <laughs> now, it. The, but I mean, even the destruction scene in this is just the same as the type of destruction we saw in X. You can't help but draw the parallels. It doesn't help. It doesn't help that the towers create a pentagram. Even though there's four of them, yeah, <laughs> it's weird. But the well, uh, four of them. But the. But I believe the. I believe the Mikra are meant to represent the five elements. Um, sort of. They're actually meant to. They're if you look at it, Tsuchigumo is earth, Wan Yudo is fire, Kamaitachi is air, Kappa is water. The only thing they they they, they went with the Hellenistic elements. They didn't go with with uh wood wood metal fire earth and and uh, water. Well, it, it is it it has been argued that some that some parts of the Hellenistic elements were an import from Buddhism, um, but that but it's but that kind of thing is up for debate. Uh, considering how far ancient Greece was from when Buddhism was formed, no, no, <laughs> no, absolutely not. <laughs> now that be that being said. What you do have is a is a clash of ideals, and I, it's in these last two episodes where Echo's real philosophy comes into play. Um, he is somebody who fe- who who felt that who felt that that um the ci- that the city had failed it, that the city as it w- as it was turning into failed him, and making and making his jo- making his job impossible. And also killing all yokai. Mm-hmm. He, he felt that he could no longer protect both sides of the world because that's what that's what Karis does. He protects the city, both the humans and the yokai. And because the yokai were fading away, he felt that the, that the way the city was changing was at fault. And yeah, by the by the end of it, his his approach is to just destroy the city and start and start over. And it do, it does put into context a lot the line that he had early on about the city rejecting him. Yeah, at the beginning of uh, episode two, mm-hmm. he said he said, "You know, I do believe this city hates me." And 
he does Echo does end up losing out, losing out in the end, but gives a ominous warning that with enough time, um, Otoya might. Oh, sorry. Why did I say Oto? Why did I say that? <laughs> it's it's Otoha. Yeah, Otoha would would fall would fall down the same path, and Otoha doesn't really res doesn't really respond on that, but. It kind of reminds me of what Meyer Link said to D when we talked about bloodlust. About how yeah. about how eventually the he'd be tempt he'd he'd be hunted by an by he'd end up falling to the same temptations that Link did. Yeah. And D's only response was, "Well, if that's if that's the case, and I'm the one being hunt, I'm the one being hunted, then so be it." Yep. Um, and of course, at the very, very end, we see that underneath it all, underneath the pain, the anguish, the the uh, the insanity, mm -hmm. the ravenous need for violence, the megalomania, Echo loves the city. The very last thing in his mind, as he's dying, is seeing Yurine. Yurine is behind Otoha up on some upper tracks of the, of the, uh, of, I forget which rail line that is, but, um, he starts walking towards her and even calls out her name before he perishes. Mm -hmm. And it's with that, that a few other people, uh, there is one last, uh, thread that we didn't mention that because it wasn't nearly as important as it, as it kind of seemed. When Sagisaka reappeared during the Ushioni fight, to protect his daughter, he allowed himself to get picked up by Ushioni to be eaten. He's like, I've studied you guys for so long! And he opens up his cloak, or his coat, and it's covered in different uh, warding, uh, war warding uh, charms and uh, onyoji papers, and he leaps into Ushioni's mouth and gets eaten, and Ushioni's just like, because, you know, I don't think a Mikura is fully yokai anymore. I don't think it can really apply. Probably, in fact, I think it's outright, I think Ushioni outright says that. Yeah, useless. Uh, what a useless gesture or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and it, at this point, they return to, uh, we, we flash forward a little bit. Um, Kude is packing up to go back to the... Uh, back to the boonies that he was from, and he's taking uh, Michiru with him. Um, but as he's standing on his veranda, Sagi Saka shows up and is talking to him, and then fades away because he's a ghost. Mm -hmm. uh, which I felt was a really good like way to tell Kude everything's going to be alright. Yeah. And uh, from there... Uh, <laughs> He and Michiru are getting on a bus, and Chizuru, the unluckiest girl in the world, dressed as a kappa, which she calls a water goblin again in the last fucking episode! <laughs> you called them all the same fucking names for the rest of the fucking show! Why? That was, that was made just to piss you off there, bud. Yes, it was. <laughs> I will believe that for all eternity. But, uh... She shows up and tells them that she doesn't want to leave the city because she just really likes it there. And now she's advertising for uh, a toilet paper company. It'll make your water goblins go away, is what she says. And um, and they say their goodbyes. And as everyone is going to their own lives, Kude and uh, Michiru, Chizuru, and... The little girl who remains nameless, who is now in an orphanage, um, little crow feathers come down to them to indicate them as friends. And looking up at some of the reconstruction, Kude and uh, Michiru, who had been having a conversation about, do you think Tokyo's going to be okay? Do you think they can recover? Uh, Kude looks up, sees Karis in his full gold trim with black uh, or black trimmed with gold i should say the trim is gold uh glory and yurine on his shoulders are glinting in the sunlight on top of a giant uh dragon statue and mm -hmm. uh kude says so long as those two are here 
I think the city's going to be just fine. Mm -hmm. And with that, Karis closes. There is a weird post credit scene with Echo's boot found by someone, but it's never gone into. Yeah. The one thing that remained of Echo after his death is that mechanical boot, because it was a truly physical item. Mm -hmm. um, and so it fell into a crevice when he died. And when and when they restored most of Tokyo, it was sealed up in the sewer that was below hand. So someone found the boot in the sewers, but that stinger never goes anywhere. They've never done anything else with Karis, and I don't think they ever will. Especially since this was meant to be one giant anniversary project. Now, before before we go into final judgment, there's a few pr there's a few production things I'd l I'd like to go into. Okay. Um. One of one of them is a quote from director Keiichi Sato. Just as New York City has Spider Man and Gotham City has Batman. I think it's time for Japan to have its own local hero. Yes. I love that quote. And what I find what I find amusing with that quote in hindsight is a bit of a subculture in in different parts of Japan where th where um different regions have their own local hero. They do. Oh, to um Almost, almost in a mascot-like um, portrayal. Several of the several of these local heroes showed up in the series Dogengers, which I'd actually go so far as as providing me with more laughs than Akiba Ranger did, even though they're on the same ballpark. <laughs> including, including the one guy with the with the most excessively complicated finishing move setup I've ever seen. <laughs> How complicated? Voltron Force complicated. Yeah. <laughs> but I think it's one th one other thing that I found I found very interesting was in regard to the score. A lot a lot of classical sound and then I found out why. It's because they had tapped the help of the Prague Symphony Orchestra. Mm-hmm. And I, fi I find that I find that very, very in I find it very interesting because you have that you have this international crossing of borders. It's not the first time. I think I think the if I recall the um the Isra the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra had helped out with Macross Plus. I'm pretty sure. Let me let me check. I will channel my uh my inner flutter for this. Mm -hmm. And even just even just little things with the detail, like them like them getting a Nissan Skyline and recording its engine noise to get to get the stock sound for engines. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Um, the score for Macros Plus was was composed by Yoko Kano. Uh, the orchestral score was recorded by the Israel Philharmonic, except for Dogfight, which was u which was recorded by the Czech Philharmonic. Which, uh, which was, if it's the same one that I'm thinking of, that was one of the weirder song songs on the soundtrack. It was the um, track used during the final battle between Isamu and Gold. Mm -hmm. uh, but. The, just for just for a minute, if the the one the one downside to co to covering it as we did is, I don't think there's been a a behind a um behind the scenes feature in any of the DVDs for Karas, because just go just going through the production history, there were some fascinating things that they did in order to get this visual style. Yeah, I I don't, you know we. We couldn't really get the DVD versions. I wasn't able to find a good one. Mm -hmm. Like, like we said, we don't. <clears throat> I'm not. I'm not saying go out and sail the high seas, but I'm. But I'm not a fan of giving people no choice. And if it. Yeah. And if no. If no choice is given, then. 
do then do I would rather I would rather people I would rather people be able to see it in whatever form that takes. Do what thou must. Mm -hmm. Do what you gotta do, but do it. It, it. it is worth the hunt. But I know it. I know it's temp I know it's tempting to scoff at um at the use of three D in anime, and I personally ha I have my own issues with it. But I do understand the appeal to animators because it's easier to correct er it's easier to correct errors or make or make um ch or make changes with three D than it is with two D cells. Well, and I think that the these guys took the uh, the time and effort to properly interpolate the three D with the two D. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing, apparently, apparently, the CG director Takeyuki Chiba had studied a stagecraft technique in Kabuki called Karen. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, which is basically a catch-all for things like trap doors, revolving stages, and the like to help to help immer to help immerse people in a kabuki stage play. Yeah, and wanted to, and wanted to try and integrate some of those tech some of those techniques within the, within this, which I think we saw really effective during a lot of the uh, fast-paced dogfighting. Especially some of those things where he was, like, having Karis stick a um, a grappling hook into the wall to go around a corner, and the whole scene revolved with Karis. Mm -hmm. Also, <clears throat> it, was re it was reflected by another staffer that um, a... 30 minute episode of an anime would would typically have about 300 keyframes. The first <laughs> episode of Karas had 700. That means they were animating on ones. They had to be. Yeah. That's that's dedication. And for for things like dust and rubble, they use stuff like rice seasoning powder and bird seed, bird seed, just scanning them. Yeah, which is that's I'm gonna be honest, that's actually fucking genius. And the the reason why I point these kind of things out is, you don't do these kind of things unless you're insanely dedicated to. To the to the craft of the story you want to make, and it's very evident that they were. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd also like to go over the fact that, uh, like you pointed out, they had a Philharmonic Orchestra assisting them with the, with their score. Mm -hmm. Um, there was a light motif for the whole series. Uh, that we heard pretty commonly throughout not just the openings but throughout everything else um the the like we have harped on again and again uh, on all of these episodes of the parliament musical identity is very important and chorus has its musical identity for sure and it centers around that leitmotif because there was there was always that triumphant um, jingle that we always kept hearing. Ba 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 mm. ba. That that whole thing was the centerpiece, the heroic moment, because the rest of it was very uh, floaty music, usually pretty dark and and changing between extremes uh, to signify the more horrific or more tense aspects but you always knew because of that jingle because of that light motif because of that identity the hero was there mm -hmm. and they were going to be the hero yeah now it should be obvious by now but i think i unless it unless there's any other things that i think it's time we head into our final judgments all right well Good brothers and good sisters, the Parliament has come to the end of deliberations. As such, Monk, I turn to you. Is Karis Weeb or Scrub? 
Now, I will level with you. Karas is something that I discovered completely by accident. <laughs> par, for the, par for the course with a lot of stuff, but at the risk of sounding too Minnesotan, I have Shinders to thank for me discovering Karas. <laughs> Fair. If you and as far as what as far as what the hell is a Shinders, if you're from if you've been in Minnesota at any at any point in time, especially in especially in the nine in the nineties and two thousands, you know what Shinders is. <laughs> and I'm going through the com- I'm going through the comic section after I had just finished reading an issue of Indian Spider Man, which <laughs> is not as bad as you think it would be. I end up seeing this. I end up seeing this Karas thing. I never. It was just one issue of what looked like a mini series that was meant to tie into the anime. And on the back of it is a is a um, one page promo for the Soul Taker, which I ha- which I have seen. And I ended up doing a bit of digging. And of course, once I start, I end up going down the rabbit hole. We do that around here. A little bit. A little bit. And Karas is is if I'm being if I'm being honest, what we saw, what we saw was was a very very good origin story. And I felt for the longest time that Car- that Karas as a character concept is one that ha- is one that ha- that can be that could have been f- that could be further explored with time. This might just be the old, the age-old adage of the brightest star burns twice as fast, but I can't, but I can't deny that I want to see more of it, especially when seeing those other um, Karas's later, later into the story. But as far as this story goes, the only I've I've seen some people derive it as a good as a good versus evil story, and I'm like, those stories are gonna keep are gonna keep being around because they work. But moreover, the only real fault I can have is some issues with the translation script, as well as the fact that the story relies a lot rel- it relies a lot more on inference than exposition. Which, for me, that's not as much of a problem. For others who are more who are more used to an expository type of a uh, world setting up, that is going to be an issue. That, however, is not enough of an issue for, to detract from the fact that this is very much a weeb entry. If it weren't for if it weren't for the ridiculous prices or the gambling, I would have advised people to get the DVD of this. Indeed. So the monk has decided that Karis be weeb. Now, you, brother Maddie, your decision: weeb or scrub. I have you two to thank for for for, for introducing me to, to this beautiful little sub series. It's OVA that this this thing of deliciousness that that has influences and all over the place and has influences uh, has made influences or been influenced by other things in the past and has influenced things in the future. I'll get there, boys. I'll, I swear to God, I'll get there. Mm-hmm. Um. <laughs> This is like the visual. Like you watch this and you you think, okay, maybe a couple of things look off. But if you if you said this was made in the 2010s, early or, or, or in the middle of it, you would think you would think fair play. But the fact that this is made in in the early 2000s must come com, com, it must be commended for that alone. Just the visual eye candy, the gore, the vore, the everything. It looks it looks delicious. It looks good. The sto- the story is excellent. I look, I could go on all day, but this is an absolute weeb. You, seek it out. Please seek it out. Mm-hmm. All right. Brother Matty has decided that Chorus is weeb. As for myself, this episode is my love story for this. I'm the one who suggested we watch this. Because I absolutely adore this series, 
and do not believe it has nearly the recognition or viewership that it deserves. The visual style is actually quite unique. Uh, the usage of 3D is masterful for 2005, which is when it started. Mm -hmm. And this, as I pointed out before, the scoring is fantastic. It's not as bombastic as some of the other entries or in your face, such as with Arcane, but I'm, it is I'm a I'm going to argue it doesn't need it. Yes, exactly. It's there to bring up the moments that need to be brought up, set the mood for the moods that need to be set. But it doesn't need to be as pulse pounding in your face because yeah. that's the the art. That's the the that's even the dialogue. That is everything else. This is honestly, it's not nostalgia goggles because we did just fucking watch it. Mm -hmm. So fuck you, anyone claiming nostalgia goggles, nostalgia goggles, because I will punch you in the teeth. <clears throat> but to me, this is Tatsunoko trying to go, you know us from all of these things we've done. This is the culmination of that learning journey and the first step on, an, on, an, on the road to, into the future. This is Tatsunoko saying, we love our work. This is a love letter to ourselves and putting that out for other people. And it is possibly the best way you could introduce anyone to Tatsunoko, to any of their works. Give them chorus and go backwards and forwards. Show the, in, the influences of the past and where they've gone in the future. And if with chorus as the starting point, you cannot go wrong. Mm -hmm. So I, it should be fairly obvious that I absolutely vote chorus to be weeb. And with three weeb and no scrub, Chorus is declared as Weeb. And, and I would fist fight these two if they tried to declare it Scrub. And, I was um, going to say, and, dude, you, the, the biggest joke was, like, no, it's Scrub. Throw it away. No, not worth, no, not worth it. I would, I would, I'd be like, Maddie, we're going in the ring. You're going down. And, no, uh, no. And, uh, I, would, I was going to say the big joke would be like, no, no. You would, I would say the big joke was you would have said it's Scrub. <laughs> no. And hey, um, G Kids, would it kill you to give this thing a re-release? That would be so nice. Either G Kids or 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 um. Manga or, Entertainment was the one who released it last time. Yeah, just manga, manga Entertainment. Just give it over to Sentai Studios. You're not doing much these days. I would, I would absolutely love a re-release of these DVDs. You don't even have to touch anything up. Just take the masters, put them on new DVDs. Don't even have to upscale them or, or, or touch them up for Blu-ray. That actually tends to destroy older anime. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. I've seen the Blu-rays for, uh, for G Gundam. And while they certainly look sharp, you also sharply see more of the animation errors. Um, just take the masters, new DVDs. That's it. That's all we want. That's all we need. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or at the very least, put it at the, ver at the very least... Put the put the masters on um on any pick a pick a streaming service at this point. I don't care I don't care which one as long as it's on at least one of them. Um, I'd I'd prefer ret I'd prefer Retro Crush for this kind of thing because it'd be right in their wheelhouse. But that's but that's just me. If, I just want I just want people to be able to watch this without 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 um having to either sail the high seas. Or, or go through, or go through the Russian roulette that is trying to get physical copies of this. But that will do it for this particular episode of of the <laughs> Parliament. Yeah, I know, I know, I almost flipped. I know, I almost flipped. See, folks. Uh... This is why we. This is why going too long will hurt your will hurt your your hosting skills. Now, that being said, <laughs> for I I'd, I'd say a good chunk a good chunk of the episodes that we've done that we've done of the Parliament of Geeks have been somewhat fantastical, both literally in a lot of cases and a bit more figuratively and one other. But for the next one. I want to do something a little more grounded, because when we come when we come back in a few weeks' time, 
one of us will have become a confidence man. Oh, God. Played in by Freddie Mercury. You'll see why, you'll you'll see. See why when the time <laughs> comes. Uh, yeah. But until um, then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.